Okay, uh, thank you everyone for getting back to the conference. Um, we are now continuing with the uh, first discussion panel of the day, uh, which is going to address the challenges of citizen C participation in policy making. Uh, we're having uh, four very interesting uh, speakers, and I will introduce them. Uh, first, left of me is Tilan Gurenshek, PhD, um, head of the section for digital inclusion at the Office of Government of the Republic of Slovenia for Digital Transformation. Tilan, welcome. Following Cristina Rensalo, PhD from eGovernance Academy Foundation from Estonia. Hi, Cristina. Um, Alvin Keots. My colleague, distinguished colleague from NGO sector, um, he is the coordinator of the consortium Slovenian Thematic NGO Networks from Slovenia. Hi, Alvin. And Andrei Vozlic, also PhD, he is a practitioner in digital de decentralized governance and blockchain democracy from uh, Slovenia. <coughs> uh, first of all, um, we more or less all know each other because we are collaborating from different projects. And the basic idea of this panel is to highlight the different aspects of e-participation from different stakeholders' perspectives. So we are going to look at the, how the government sees the e-participation area, how the academia experts are looking at these uh, 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 challenges, also how the NGO civil society and the practitioners, developers, <coughs> are facing with the challenges. Um, some of these challenges have been already highlighted during the presentations from the, our uh, speakers at the beginning of the conference. And this is going to be kind of background for our uh, discussion. Uh, to start with the first question uh, to all of you. Um, the first question is, what do you think are the currently the main challenges of citizens' e participation in policy making? And I would like to give the floor first to Tilen to give us his view from the government, what do you think are, from the viewpoint of the government, the main challenges, um, in theory, also in the practice, there is somehow discussion about it. There, are, there are issues with the frequent changes in the government structures. Also, it's hard to keep the policy focus on different public policies. Also, policy overload, um, lack of capacity for consulting online with citizens. So these are all the some challenges that the government is also uh, facing in this area. So, you know, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simon. Uh, a warm greetings to everybody offline and online. Um, I'm very grateful to be today with all of you because uh, I think that uh, we all have to be included into the discuss discussions about uh, e-participation, democracy, and especially how to basically use the process of digitalization um, to benefit humanity as much as possible. And with that, I would like to basically give maybe a bit a more general answer. Um, so Simon already mentioned that uh, frequent changes in government structures and policy focus can be one of, the, one of the challenges. And we can basically clearly see that if we look at the European landscape, basically in most of the countries where the government uh, structure basically changes uh, frequently, we have this uh, rather, uh, rather uh, unpleasant state of uh, bureaucratic chaos, because when government structures change, uh, a lot of new people come into the, into the system. A lot of new people have to learn um, different, uh, different work uh, habits, but not only that, they have to adopt the culture of the organization. And as every other organization, government is also an organization. So uh, when somebody goes uh, to a government structure, he basically has to uh, complete more or less the same theoretical onboarding process that uh, anybody else has to, that goes into uh, some other organization, either that be a non-governmental organization or private sector organization. And also policy focus. Um, if you take uh, COVID-19 uh, for, for an example, um, we can clearly see that the policy focus before COVID was something else. And then COVID came, one of the most influential uh, outside uh, factors, um, and it basically 
uh, in some aspects radically changed the policy focus of different national states. Then the next, uh, next challenge could be policy overload. So there are instances when there is just uh, too much of different uh, agendas that are basically presented uh, to, to, to the wi wider civil society. And it often happens that this policy overload uh, is kind of a backslash. So instead of, uh, instead of more participation, the multilateral approach, uh, interdisciplinary approach, what happens is that as human beings, we start to basically um, order those uh, uh, those uh, those uh, policies uh, by its importance by its uh, interest uh, how we understand it so basically most of the time we put those policies that we don't uh, that we understand the least in the back but that doesn't mean that those policies are not as important as some of those that we put on the, in the front um, the next uh, the next uh, challenge could be lack of capacity for consulting uh, online with citizens. Uh, this is again something that uh, basically COVID showed. It showed that uh, as a as a state, as a government, we have to invest a lot of uh, a lot of resources, uh, financial time resources, human resources into basically building uh, a platform for successful uh, online consulting with citizens. Uh, of course, there is there is also complexity of involving different stakeholders because. We are a so heterogeneous group of uh, Homo sapiens, so often it is uh, quite challenging to basically bring us all uh, together. But uh, that, is all, that is only a challenge, it's not, it's not something that uh, cannot be overcome. So governments in 21st century, and this is also the view of our government, have to tackle this challenge, how to basically bring us all together. And for instance, one of the topics that uh, we are trying to do that is hate speech. How to successfully mitigate mm -hmm. and challenge uh, all the uh, negative, uh, negative aspects uh, and influences of, of hate speech. And in order to achieve this, all of us have to come together. All of us have to collaborate uh, on how to develop a successful system that basically includes us all and enable, enables us to tackle this problem. Uh, and the last but not, le uh, not the least is low interest into policy making online. So what we already discussed uh, previously and were able to see uh, from previous presenters, um, it is not necessary that uh, interest into online uh, policy making is growing uh, with the progress of digitalization, uh, digitalization and digital culture. So apparently there are some factors that have to be taken into consideration why this is happening. It might be because topics are not uh, mm. interesting enough, or it might be because everybody is not included. So we have to take the digital divide, digital gap into consideration. Do, does every citizen, citizen have the necessary uh, technological requirements to be, to be able to participate, uh, etc., etc.? Bottom line, uh, focus should not only be on ICT part of e-participation, but more attention should be given to collaboration with policy stakeholders on national level and basically involving citizens uh, through better advocacy strategies. So this is part of a political culture. Um, many citizens also do not uh, recognize various initiatives for e-participation as relevant because they, the citizens, are mainly targeted as consumers of these e-participation platforms. So we go back to the, to the first problem again, instead of being the stakeholders, uh, so using the top-down uh, approach. Um, also, some topics are just too technical and uh, specific for uh, general uh, audiences. So <coughs> that would be my input <laughs> for now. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, Dylan, thank you very much. Um, I would just pick one um, uh, topic that um, you really um, highlighted, and I think it's very important also for the next um, uh, speaker. Uh, Christina, uh, Dylan highlighted this gap between the technological development and the demo democratic developments. We are seeing this gap, we are developing more and more technologies, but on, on the other hand, we are facing some issues with the 
how democracy is developing in terms of the declining trust into government institutions, into democratic processes. We have these more and more less, uh, more and more uh, clashes between society, different values, different norms, um, you know, and also highlighted the problem of the hate speech. So, how, what is your perspective on these social uh, conditions that have to be met in order that we, that order to have full exploitation of the digital technology in the for democratic processes? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, actually, actually, my distinguished uh, co-panelists already mentioned all those challenges were uh, pretty much in line with the challenges I was also able to think of, uh, but maybe I was structuring them a little bit in a different way, so I would really start with this trust issue. So actually I named kind of like three group of challenges. So one group of challenges are related really with this trust or are around trust issues. And I'm going deeper that there are several levels of challenges related to trust. But the second group, bigger group, I think, uh, related to or challenges are related to lack of sense of duty or, or competencies and the capacities and skills you were also mentioning several times quite rightly. And, and third group, I would like to say that they are challenges related more closely to communication and you know creating motivation and motivation creating this level of motivation which really changes behavior. So these three groups, but I will start with trust issue and several levels of trust. So this really this bigger or the, the, the highest level of, of, of question or challenge is really how to how to bring back citizens' uh, faith and trust and hope in happy ending. I would say it, it's this way, it, it sounds dramatically, but really uh, the, the way citizens look at the current uh, democracies, how can we expect, let's say, hope something out of this participation, or I don't know, say, don't see any, any light in the end of the tunnel, if they are looking at our current, even those old and role model democracies, and, and this is really a big challenge. And, and, but partly, I'm not looking at the face of government or politicians, and not blaming them, because if we look at the current situation, when they have to make very quickly, very harsh decisions on uh, how much to rise, I don't know, defense money, or or how quickly they need to rise tax taxes because we just cannot face other way the crisis. And at least in Estonia, this is legally decided, or this is decided in constitution that we cannot engage citizens in in tax issues. We cannot engage as government or politicians, decision making citizens in deciding on defense money, then how can you, as, as government or politicians, engage them? But at the same time, it, of course, rises this uh, dissatisfaction and disappointment in citizens. And this is a really big challenge. So second um, kind of sub-challenge related to, to trust issues, I think that, again, uh, going more to the e-participation, that, again, citizens do lack good success stories of e-participation, really impactful e-participation cases. And even if those success stories exist somewhere, we do not tell, probably we as, as experts, we as decision makers, we are not uh, telling them that, or we are, we, we are not able to showcase them this way, that they really show the impact citizens directly have on making this or another decision. So this is another, another big challenge, how to make it better, um, how to design, orchestrate, uh, implement, and monitor participation, and also how to promote and spread the word uh, about successful stories. And last, trust issues, really, I would also raise the trust in technology. That on one hand, we should be more and more skeptical towards technology as at personal level, of course, we should. And we are getting the message, you should not trust technology. And partly this is also true. But partly, if we expect citizens to participate, we should still do whatever possible. Of course, they should be using technology safely and securely. They should have skills for that. 
but say should trust technology. What I see in Estonia, for instance, even in Estonia, which should be kind of digital role model, there is one party, one political power who does everything possible to even, you know, destroy voting, uh, telling that you, you, you cannot trust technology. And so, I mean, of course, then again, we cannot expect e-participation if citizens. So these are so trust, but, but and you also mentioned capacities and skills. I think the civic, civic skills generally really is lacking, but not only that government people are lacking skills to engage citizens, but also me, even coming from civil society side, I can, I can truly say that also citizens still do lack skills to be participating impactfully and meaningfully. And really, we, as civil society organizations, should make everything possible also to, to educate, to give those skills, and to learn young people to think critically and, and analytically and all that. This is a huge issue. And, and of course, media, sk media literacy and digital skills, even also, I mean, we, we, we think that citizens are already digitally skills. skilled if they can, I don't know, Google and, and, and use social media, but to, to be participating, we still need to educate them. And, and yes, and finally, this motivation, uh, and this is, of course, very much connected to already with with all those uh, promoting more you know, success stories and really show the outcome and i think final point is um, related to this motivation and and uh, and then changing behavior that we as those who engage be it initiator so the civil society organization or more government side we under we we overestimate citizens' expectation to be always, uh, that their ideas are always accepted and, you know, that we think that rather we don't engage them because they might be disappointed with the outcome. But I think we, we underestimate citizens' acceptance even with rejections if, again, if they are explained what have been restrictions, what is the clear outcome, what is the impact of one another uh, decision, why this or another argument has not been taken into account. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You already have. Uh, um, Isima, thank you very much also for for uh, scoping this uh, broader societal issues relating to e-participation. Um, we are now closing to the level of the citizen the civil society, and I would like to invite um, Albin. Albin, all your professional career in the NGO sector is related to active citizenship. Um, as, as long as I know you, um, you have been active um, in the starting with environmental issues, now with development and cooperation. How do you see uh, how the digitalization has changed the way the NGO sector and also citizens are approaching um, in terms of involvement of democratic processes. And what are your opinion and challenges um, here in terms of the skills, uh, digital device was also mentioned. Um, what is your perspective on that? How much time do we have? <laughs> um, please keep it five minutes if possible. <laughs> uh, not, not my uh, biggest uh, asset. Uh, time management, by the way. Uh, so thank you, Simon, for inviting me uh, uh, to give floor also to the older citizens uh, to, to, to address this uh, uh, issue of uh, digital division in our society. That are not only horizontal, but they are also uh, uh, the opposite. But what I wanted to say is from the, from the perspective of, of a citizen, uh, we as a, as a platform for international cooperation, of course, are dealing also with the consequences of climate change. Because climate change is so overwhelming uh, uh, thing, process in the world that affects everybody. Also those who, who didn't do anything, uh, uh, who didn't add to it uh, a lot. But why I'm saying that? Because we, we were, peti we were uh, collecting uh, signatures under the petition. And today, of course, you are not doing that on the street, approaching people saying, I'm here for that and that, please, can you, would you like to support me? We do that through change.org, through digital tools, to, and so on, so on, so on. But what I found out is that uh, this is a very costly business. 
You, ha you really have to invest a lot of money to, for information, uh, uh, to, to think about how to engage people, to take time. Because when you are putting your petition out, you see that there is like 472 similar mm -hmm. petitions going around uh, who are all struggling for the same uh, souls. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's uh, so basically we are in a very old business. You know, we are fishing for human souls, so for common good. Uh, and uh, and uh, and as I remember, uh, my first computer. You know, it, it took uh, it. It was used for two things. You know, to archive uh, archive data, you know, to recall them easily, and the other one well, that came later uh, was uh, communication. Uh, I'm that generation that still remembers the sound of a modem, you know, that, that very <laughs> different thing uh, as today, because today is uh, uh, it's completely changed. But what, is, why we have introduced those tools? Because I see di di digitalization as a tool to improve what we are doing. Is that uh, we, 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 we we hoped that we are going to use it to work together better. But I don't have that feeling that it is going uh, uh, well from that point of view. Because, uh, we as a so society, an active citizen uh, is uh, somebody who goes into the society with uh, hopefully with a progressive agenda, uh, being, being involved in uh, many things that are of common interest, uh, to, to bring people uh, up to the, uh, to the, to the task to, to become active citizenship citizens also so uh, it's uh, our, but what we are facing today is uh, lack of motivation because of the consumerization of the digital space having not so many companies who are doing that you know we can maybe two hands are enough on the whole world, you know, of eight billion people, mm -hmm. you're dealing with six, seven companies. Uh, then there is a uh, there is a, an issue uh, of uh, of complexity. Uh, the the things uh, became much more complex. You because you can retrieve so many data connected to one issue that it's. You have to be an expert, but on the other hand, you need a group of colleagues that have different expertise to help you to formulate your demand. It's not. It's not. Uh, I don't think it's possible uh, to have a one-man band in the in the civil society uh, these times. Then, what we are facing is, of course, a digital divide that goes horizontal and uh, uh, what's the word? Vertical. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and it it has a big big uh, uh, impact on all of us. You know, in my generation, I know the, the most used word, uh, sentence is, "Daughter, can you explain me what I pressed something?" Uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, which is there. So what we are facing here is also uh, uh, digital skills, how to use all the new tools that are coming in and are being employed by 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 industrial world and. Uh, and uh, uh, many other uh, specialized organizations that are working on a cognitive level. So they are addressing me. I know that, you know, I'm being addressed through, through very uh, precise uh, instruments of uh, cognitive warfare uh, to imp make an impact on my decisions and cho about choices I'm doing. Yeah? Uh, it was easy before in the superstore because I knew, you know, when why some articles are where in in, in that regal. You know? But now in in today's world where we are, we have digitalized everything. Uh, uh, even if you are aware of the techniques that are behind, you, it's very hard to 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 be in in to have being the tense mode. Then, of course, uh, my strong belief is that. Uh, ICT, yeah, information and communication technology, not information, communication, working together to technologies. Yeah, this is not there. Uh, we, we're, are somehow, uh, they are not value neutral. 
N none of the technology is neutral from so social point of view. Mm -hmm. Every technology we introduce in our lives is changing how we operate, mm -hmm. has an impact on. My generation, we call each other on the phone. My daughter's generation, they make a business on Facebook. You know? It's a quite different way how, how, to, uh, how to deal with it. And of course, I, I think that uh, the, the populism that we see is in direct connection with the technologies we use without any societal uh, barriers. And that's usually what we do. We, we, we become uh, 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 very happy about, oh, we have something new that will improve. What we do. But there is a price to pay. So if we don't have some kind of a societal control about that, uh, we can get uh, 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 doomed uh, pretty sure. And I think that uh, uh, also that uh, for, for active citizen today is uh, uh, to be educated, uh, to be trained in, in digital tools that can be used uh, uh, for something, but also in defense of something. Mm -hmm. Uh, are, are the most important tasks uh, uh, if you want to to have a kind of a uh, what was it the right nice word for that uh, decent society mm -hmm. because we we are living in undecent times you know where everybody can speak horrible things through through the digital stuff and not even anonymously <laughs> they, they put their names to it. You know, so we are living also in times of no shame. And shame is a very strong social category. You know, there are things that you we shouldn't do. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, for this, um, I would say, realistic perspective on um, what the digital tools are bringing to the society and democracy. Realistic, but still not pessimistic, I would say. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> um, I'm trying to make a connection. What you said in terms of the digitalization should make our lives easier. The basic idea with all these ICT development was that we should have, at the end of the day, more time for leisure, free time. But what we think now, we are working more hours than uh, our uh, fathers and, 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 and forefathers did. And, and also this idea with the effectiveness of our work is also questionable. So um, sticking with the technology itself, um, I'm moving now to Andre. Um, you as a developer of the, of the applications um, in the field of democratic participation, your specialty is uh, debating democracy, which is also a topic of your PhD. Um, how do you see this quest, technological quest, for solving always the same issue, how to improve democracy, and always offering new technologies? We started in, in the beginning of the 90s with this, the, the, today's internet. We said, okay, Web 5.0 is going to solve the democratic issue. We, we, then we find out this is not the case. We moved to the Web 2.0, the social media. We said, okay, this is maybe going to solve the issue. Now we are having Web 2.30, 40, um, Society 5.0, and all those points and zeros uh, behind it. But still, the issues with democracy are staying the same. So, Andre, um, what is your perspective? Um, is maybe technology the right way to look for the solution, or maybe we as humans are not really taking the right approach to the tweet. Um, well, if I, uh, I start at the end, I can say that um, technology cannot save democracy and society, obviously. It's just a platform through which we can better uh, the processes that we have to master first in the analog world. So if we, if we don't master the processes in the analog world, and if we put those fail, failed processes into the digital world, we will only uh, exacerbate the problems more. So if you have, um, it's, it's the same with the robotization of processes. If you put wrong input into the robotization of <clears throat> any kind of processes, you will get a wrong uh, output in the end. So obviously uh, technology is not the solution, it's just the way 
to potentially reach a certain point in time where human society can actually uh, work and function uh, in a better way that we are used to throughout the, or that we are accustomed to throughout the centuries. Uh, it is a nice tool, definitely, uh, and it has a lot of potential, but as you said, Simon, Web 1.0 and 2.0, we were also very optimistic about them bringing democracy to the masses, but we were wrong, obviously. <laughs> and um, I'm afraid that this optimism that's, uh, that's um, circulating around Web 3.0 uh, must be maintained, uh, curbed, obviously. It has some nice potential solutions, but al also uh, booby traps that we can all fall in uh, and potentially uh, not solve anything in the end after all. But let's start with more positive, right? <laughs> we still have, the, we, we, we have uh, the technology at our hand and we are technological, we've become a technological species, humankind. Um, so let's try to make the best of it before we decide that it cannot help us really in the end, as, at least in the societal uh, aspects. Um, me as a practitioner, I, I developed a consortium for developing next generation e-participatory uh, tools a couple of years ago. And we developed uh, certain systems, which I can go later into details maybe uh, in the next uh, part of this discussion. But the, the, the thing that I would like to put out is while testing uh, those prototypes and those pilots, uh, it was pretty clear that the digital overload and the technological fatigue is the number one uh, enemy uh, mm -hmm. dividing us from, reach, uh, for, from really reaching the potential that the technology can offer us. So basically we've been in, into the technological world for so long so that's, what, more than 20, 30 years now, uh, at least in, uh, until 2000s and onwards, that uh, this sexiness of the wor word uh, technological innovation, it's, it's lost its plan for, first of all, and uh, especially, it especially goes so for the, for the punchline keywords as, uh, as e-democracy once used to be. It's not sexy anymore, right? So it, it doesn't bring audiences to, to, to listen to, to what we have to say, because it's, it's been there, it showed, it, and it proved basically nothing, so why should I bother? The normal people would ask. So we should not, first of all, maybe if I interrupt myself, we should always make clear this distinction between people that are already addressed, so that us, and we are preaching to the choir if we say, and if we try to sell those products to us, we are already the buyers, okay? So we have to find the ways how to bring new audiences uh, to, 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 to our side, quote unquote. And uh, digital uh, overload and tech fatigue was obviously the number one uh, problem that we saw while trying to implement these next generation e participatory tools because, because, oh no, not another app was the first uh, response from the people that uh, were uh, included in our test focus groups. Um, we, we are all fed up of having too many apps, so the, the struggle to present one more and promising that this one will really solve the problems, whereas the others didn't, is, is quite challenging. It proves quite challenging and time consuming, energy consuming, obviously. You, then ha you don't have, uh, as a research group, especially a startup or whatever, you don't have limitless time or, 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 or uh, any kind of resources, money, for example, obviously, a very important resource, but not the only one. Uh, so how to get past that barrier of digital overload, I'm not really sure. I, I don't have the answer uh, to this at the moment because on one side there is uh, digital over, uh, overload, but the, 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 the sector, technological sector is pushing us uh, even more so into the immersive technologies like metaverses, etc. Mm -hmm. So that we can get even more immersed into the technology. Where my, my thesis would be, we don't have any research on that, but my thesis would be that First, I guess there will, that there will have to be a certain gap, maybe 10 years, I'm just making up a number, where we will have to, to make a step back from the uh, digital innovation uh, before we can go on with digital innovation. And in those, those 10, 20 years, for example, we will really have to focus on social innovation. So I suppose that um, social innovation will have to become much more sexy, but let, let's talk about solutions uh, later on. Um, 
Okay, so the, the, next, the next obvious uh, problem why e-participation is not as popular amongst the masses of the people that we think should be is definitely that the solutions that are at the moment available um, are not, uh, in general, are not uh, very well designed. So um, there, is, there is clear lack of deep understanding of decision-making processes. So we have numerous uh, quite good and then again not very good uh, solutions for e-participation but uh, I can see a clear through line uh, which is definitely not, not, none of them I would dare say really has a deep understanding of what decision making really means is how it functions psychologically and how we should structure it in a sense that, uh, that would stimulate regular people not those who are already addressed right to really get into the process, to get involved with the process, and to, to go through the process from the beginning until the end. And um, moving on, I would definitely dare say that um, lack of basic social education is, is another thing that we should address first before we dive deeper into searching for technological solutions. Uh, obviously, because if we don't have the society that can answer to the basic questions, what society is. I mean, if we go on the street and ask normal people, can you, display, can, can you describe a, a concept of society? And then moving on, can you describe a concept of decision-making? What, what does decision-making, what does accepting decisions for you really mean? I mean, we would find that millions of different question, uh, answers, obviously, whereas it's not really that complicated, but million different answers signals one thing, that nobody really knows what it is and they are improvising. So unless we, unless we educate, start educating people from the bottom up, what uh, politics, even more complex, I mean slightly more complex uh, topics, like what, what is politics, what is the difference between politics and political systems, if the general society can, can't answer those questions, then we cannot accept them to get really uh, engaged in e-participation en masse. Okay. Okay, actually, the idea of this panel was to uh, discuss uh, challenges of <laughs> citizens and participation. And in about half an hour now, we are discussing what is society, democracy, and community, and, and what is technology, and what are uh, persons. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting um, way of flow um, how we humans are actually elaborating our thoughts around uh, specific problems. Um, Andre, thank you very much. Um, so in this first round, our speakers pointed out the different challenges connected with the, uh, using digital technologies for citizens' participation. Now I would like to ask any one of your speakers, would you like to take any thoughts from the, your following uh, speakers to maybe respond to it, elaborate a little bit further? Maybe, maybe yeah. I can jump on, on what, what Andre said. Is, uh, 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 I, think, is, I think Christina also would like to maybe to... It's a need for a, it's for a need uh, to rethink society and okay, very interesting. stop with digitalization yeah. and uh, start yes. to think about very social good. innovation. And just please be brief, not long. So just I'm usually brief. Second, <laughs> second okay, I mean, he knows me well. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, that, that's the only point I wanted to make. make you know that uh, it's uh, something what. Uh, uh, from, from the developer side is coming uh, a notion that ooh, we, should be, <laughs> we should be a little bit more careful what we are, uh, decide, what we are developing. And uh, uh, from, from my point of view is that, of course, uh, it's uh, if we are still believer, believers into a free market, laissez faire, capitalism. Uh, and we think that it's possible in today's complex world to have, so, uh, to have uh, business without any constraints, without any societal kind of control what is going on, then I think we are failing. Because it's uh, uh, when we are uh, leaving the world of, of big objects and we are going into the world of a very small object where we are talking about you know, how to program movement of atoms and how we can 
you know, in, make an impact on human mind, even from for good reasons. You know, to know if uh, I have a spine injury, that might be of help. And we know that digitalization made huge things for so many people, even in in our de developing uh, development uh, cooperation. You know, the, the digitalization brought a big uh, steps uh, uh, forward to improve uh, people's uh, li lives and uh, living conditions in, in many areas of, of, uh, of our life. But what I'm thinking is, if we should learn from the financial crisis in 2008, you know, when somebody came up, you know, what Piketty said that, you know, uh, but he wrote a very big book, but there is, <laughs> I would say with the with the saying, you know, if you are not uh, regulating the market, you will get a crisis at the end. You know, so deregulation is uh, uh, the path uh, to to be doomed. What I'm thinking is that we we need some kind of a social control about uh, uh, about what is going on in the digital world, and of course we should uh, take care about those industrial behemoths that are not here for our, or, or, they are here for our pleasure more, but not for our interests. Uh, so we should have some kind of control over them also. And this pleasure is very costly. At the end, yes. Then, okay. Thank you, Christina, please. Yes, actually, I really like this. So you brought us back to think that, well, digital should never be aimed itself, that really, I mean, I really agree with your point that the social innovation should be now in our focus and really probably even go a few steps uh, back. And because what I, I'm seeing as practitioner of doing digital engagement, mostly I'm working with municipalities, with cities, where it works better, I would say, than at national level anyway, that really the most effective and successful e-participation digital engagement for both sides, because we also monitor all the, the outcome, are really the cases where we combine offline and online, really, obviously. It's, it's, it is a, and this um, helps also to target those, what you also very rightly pointed out, that, those, that we are usually ending up with usual suspects. We are usually engaging those who are engaged anyway, who are active anyway, so this digital doesn't add any extra value here because these people would probably, I don't know, despite everything, would come anyway and be participating. But this way, when we really combine very wisely and strategically uh, selecting our tools offline and online, we can more easily target those who are beyond usual suspects, who are mostly not listened usually, who are not probably, I don't know, too modest, do not have enough skills and so on to participate. So, And we, in our practical work, again, in Academy, whenever we do digital engagement and plan our new processes, we now really engage service and process designers from private sector really to help us to really to go deep into the shoes of those target groups and, and try to show them what is their immediate benefit and value of being participating and uh, at the same time also engaging public authorities to show their, their benefits. So we have understood that we really should think much more strategically uh, as it has been done done previously. So so really this is probably my and when I'm thinking last point uh, on, on this Estonian success story, I also mentioned this banning, this really adopting new regulations started as civic initiative. Then I remember those initiators also pointed out that really one thing is is also you play with emotions and I think that Engagement should be also emotional, and you should show all emotions and, and benefit also, I mean, playfully also. Improv improvisation, I also like the work, I think that you should improvise, but at the same time, they pointed out how pragmatically they really approached politicians also and, and showed again their benefit using the timing and, and all those contextual factors also, which is very important because, as they say, many civil society organizations fail because they only play on emotions, mm -hmm. and politicians hate that. So, yeah, this is my, my point. Thank you.
Right. Um, it's okay. Um, we still have half an hour left, but we are going to just spend 20 minutes in order to then uh, open the floor for the questions. I believe there's going to be some questions regarding the scope of the issue that actually we opened and, uh, and the challenges we are facing with. And um, for the second round of the panel, um, the question is um, what are the key factors, what are the key conditions in order to make e-participation successful? Actually, we are building upon what Christina presented in the opening of the conference, um, but still, it's good to discuss this in a broader um, a forum from different um, stakeholders' viewpoints. Um, because my impression is that different areas of society have different ideas what is a success, what is a democracy, community, how should uh, citizens' participation processes uh, work, and what should be the impact. So, going backwards with uh, Andre, um, relating to your previous um, thoughts, uh, what do you think are the three, three main key factors, conditions? in order to meet these challenges that we have uh, opened in the, in the first round of discussion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, definitely uh, much uh, deeper research into the fundamentals of decision-making and uh, broader political systems and management, uh, societal management systems is needed. So, uh, in as much that we um, uh, s begin to understand more deeply how those processes are being carried out on a psychological level of the society. And if we understand that, then we can start translating this into the proper digital uh, tools um, and innovating uh, proper architectures and designs of how those tools should be constructed in a way that the normal citizen who has no uh, political or social education, for that matter, uh, would still know how to use. Uh, because everybody knows how to use uh, Instagram, for example. Not everybody knows how to use all functions of Facebook. That's one of the reasons why Facebook is failing, because there's just too many, it's just too much confusion about it. And that's why uh, uh, Instagram, for example, is so much more popular at the moment, because it's so much easier. I mean, as a society, we've come to a point where we don't, uh, we, we can't really uh, think in complex terms. So everything has to be brought to us in a sense that it's uh, doable from left to right sw swiping, basically. But I'm, but I'm not, not uh, trying to point out that we should build a participatory system that it's like swiping a high like this, I don't like that. Uh, I'm just saying, I'm trying to point out that we should uh, focus on user experience much more and we should come closer to the end uh, segment, which is obviously not the ones who are already addressed us, right? We you know how to use those. Uh, at least we have uh, we have an incentive to dig deeper. If we don't know how to use it, we'll learn. Whereas normal people will not. And if they uh, if they uh, if they um, if they see a wall of understanding before they even get any satisfaction gratification out of it, uh, they will they will back off and they will not use the system. Uh, they will never return to use the system. So we have to focus on user experience first. In order to do that. Uh, we have to, but first, in order to do that, we have to understand what uh, decision-making processes psychologically really look like and where does it start, when, where does it end. And the research shows that there can be improvements made in, in these aspects, in these areas. And we are trying to implement those kind of architect architectures in our own uh, e participatory tools. So I think uh, bottom line is there is definitely optimism to be held here, but we have to switch the, shift, shift the, the, the focus from technology to a person, so let's let's build the technology from the perspective of, of the person, and not let's not let's stop trying to build the technology uh, for the technology's sake because it's sexy to be innovative in, in technology uh, technological terms. So you pointed out two success factors: so better understanding of how societal and political processes are are are, are working, and the user experience. So maybe briefly add the third one. Okay. <laughs> Just very briefly. Sure. Um, definitely, uh, from the technological point of view, I don't think that there is too much to add. So we have to come back. I have. To, I mean, I, I've been dealing with technology for so long and uh, implementing the technology from the 
perspective of social uh, scientist, uh, not not a technology uh, technolo uh, technologician per se was the word. <laughs> uh, so, so, and, and this is what always brings me back to the to the. I like technology. My father was a programmer. Uh, he's retired now, but I've been. Uh, encircled by computers since my age five, whatever. I, I even programmed some stuff on Spectrum, even in whatever, whatnot. But um, uh, so I'm really engrossed in technology since I remember myself, and this is exactly why I think that we should all move the third, the third, the third one. One. I don't know, is there a third one? Basically negating whatever has been said in the, in the, first, in the first point. This would be my two, two cents for those. Thank you very much. Alvin, mean, please, your three key success factors, conditions. My father is a carpenter. <laughs> uh, and he said, when I helped him, he said, after watching me, he said, uh, son, uh, keep your business with books. You know? uh, uh, so it's, uh, 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 it's uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, well, to, how to formulate that? It's, uh, if we were listening carefully what, 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 what was said in the last uh, half an hour, you know, uh, there was formulations like we need deep, uh, deeper understanding of the decision-making process. Uh, we should, you know, know uh, the emotions of people, you know, uh, to, you know, all that stuff. So to re-enact something, what is going on in the real life, to make it possible to, to digitalize it, well, God, you know, the, the secrecy has a has a has a function in in a society. This is what what, what we have to take care about. Uh, that take we, we should be really, I would say, uh, uh, very careful when when we are uh, opening up uh, boxes that uh, shouldn't be opened so easily, and the secrecy and. S uh, Simon knows me well. Uh, I, I worked for Freedom of Information for all my life, and uh, when I when when, when uh, you know digitalization helped to that a lot. You know the, the, our governments are now much more transparent than they were ever do. The, my biggest concern is there are not so many people looking into those data because they could find a lot of things <laughs> that are going not well for for from the common interest point of view. Uh, for example, European Pollutant Emission Register, you know, who knows that? But it was a, it was a revolutionary tool uh, to deal with uh, environmental uh, uh, pollution uh, for some, or something like that. But three things, what I would like to point, point out are very clear. Human rights as the key orienteer of whatever we are doing. Inclusion, you know, all the processes have to be inclusive. And people at center, not the digital uh, avatars of whatever. People, real, real people, you know, who go to, jo to work every morning in those shoes. We would like to understand how they decide to move. Yeah? Uh, and uh, from, from that point of view, to me, it's, uh, it's again, the issue of, uh, of uh, how we understand uh, ourselves. Is it really necessary to do something? We, we can do, yeah, we, it's, no. you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, there are very tough choices we, we will have to do, and I hope that today's uh, discussion opened some lines of thought that we might go into that uh, as, a, as a civil society, as, a, as, a, as the government, the, the developer, they're guilty of everything, by the way. Yeah. They play, they play with things. <laughs> <laughs> and so on. So I it's, it's there, there are a lot of tasks you for us. talk a lot um, during the lunch time. So, <laughs> <laughs> Alvin, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, I actually... Sorry, Christina. Uh, I was thinking to give the, okay. the, the, no. the floor to Ivan, um, because um, you, because you're coming from Estonia, I would like to spare the last question for the e-voting, okay. and then also try to ask so Tilen what he's thinking of e-voting from the maybe we point to the government that any plans. So maybe Tilen, your three points of okay. success factors, and then going to Christina okay. and then back. To Thank you. I would agree with Mr. Albin that the first one is inclusion. So how can government reach uh, everyone? We already talked about this a few minutes ago. We have certain hard-to-reach groups 
that we will never be able to reach with uh, online methods and tools. So we have to have some offline uh, process or offline tools to be able to reach those two. We, we cannot determine, we cannot proposition that uh, being digital is something that everybody should be. We will not come, uh, I, I think that the, the, the momentum where 100% of society will be digital, online, well, we will probably not live to see it. It might happen in the, in the future, but we won't, be there, we won't be there to see it. So we have, to, we have to think about how to include everybody without regard if they are digital or if they are analog. So that is the first one. The second one is participation how to engage citizens in decision-making and public servicing processes. So basically, how, how to achieve the, the momentum of society that like we already discussed before, um, so that something doesn't come out of popularity after 10, 15, 20 years. So how to see, achieve this cultural change. Uh, and at this point, I would like to... Uh, point out that at the government office for digital transformation we do not understand digitalization as a technological challenge but as a so societal challenge it's about changing the mindset of society in order to harness the power of technologies uh, that is very important because we have this opportunity to be creative to think about how can gamification for instance help us to to raise this uh, this level of participation of citizens could it be that uh, there might be a partly solution within this concept? I do not know. We do not know yet because we are, uh, uh, we are just experimenting with these uh, models of, of uh, uh, societal collaboration. But these are, these are instances that could give us a uh, uh, few answers on how to proceed. And the third one is basically access to information. So we need open government data as much of it as possible in order to be able to not only um, have effective and effic efficient decision-making processes, but also to have effective, efficient, and especially um, honorable uh, discussions so that we don't exclude uh, each and everybody of us when we talk about something and we maybe not agree about it. We have to find a method how to, uh, even if we disagree, how to find a common solution, because only that will basically uh, enable us to move forward. And I would, I would uh, just uh, like to point out uh, two more things about how, two, two examples, how we try to do this on strategic and on operational level at Government Office for Digital Transformation. The strategic level is that we want to include this very important notion into digital strategy of uh, Slovenia, Digital Slovenia 2030, so that our vision is that every citizen should have in person as well as online a chance to actively continue and responsibly participate in the community at all levels. So this is one of the strategic uh, strategic goals, if I can put it, if I may put it like that. And the operational uh, is basically we are trying to amend and add additions to Digital Inclusion Act with more focus on including uh, NGOs and uh, in digital inclusion and digital transformation efforts. That means more targeted and pre pre precise uh, regulatory frameworks for subsidizing various groups of residents when it comes to digital transformation of society. So we believe that uh, models as quadruple helix uh, for, uh, for cooperation in creation, uh, digital skills, digital inclusion. Uh, we have the, the, the European framework for digital competences. The second group, communication and collaboration, clearly indicates the skills, the competences that need to, need to be learned in order to make uh, e-participation efficient and effective. So you see, when we talk about e-participation, we cannot go uh, without talking about digitalization, uh, about uh, society as a wider uh, concept. Thank you. Ina, yeah, thank you very much for, for um, making kind of um, framework of how the government, in terms of the policy making and regulation, is thinking about those issues that we highlighted uh, uh, from practice. Um, thank you very much. Um, Christina, you, you already highlighted um, success factors in your presentation, but 
and not to repeat yourself, I was thinking maybe of asking you, challenging you, to explain us what you think are the three main success factors um, for e participation in terms of the fact that Estonia is the only country in the world so far having uh, more than a decade of successful practice of online voting, e voting. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. briefly. <laughs> yeah, I know briefly well. I'm not, I mean, I, I do not consider myself really a, an expert in e voting. I know this is a burning issue always whenever Estonians come into the game, it's always uh, this question. But I think that it somehow still relates what uh, to, the, to the point you, you, you really was, was bringing up that this um, uh, human rights and inclusiveness, and I think this is absolutely right, and this digital tools should be in service of democracy. This is one of the most important principles. And second one, really, we, we should not provide only digital tools. When do, doing this, we should also do, make sure that we develop digital culture, we address digital vulnerability and all these. So these, I think, and this goes also for, for the sea voting I think that, well, in a way, Estonia has benefited from digitalization. It's still one kind of success story in itself. I'm not happy about how how quickly, or rather, to put it, how slowly we develop right now with everything, with with the services, with with digital transformation, with digital participation, and and the on on. But I think our start, our kickoff, was really good one, and 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 I think that partly because those two principles were followed, because we really wanted our biggest ambition was to build from scratch. A, a secure, inclusive, transparent, anti-corrupt society. And this was the main driving force for digitalization. And of course, e-voting or making voting also more inclusive, giving new opportunities, was also part of this agenda. And I think it has fulfilled its, its kind of aims. As I mentioned, there are still surprisingly, shockingly, there are even Estonian powers, of course, far right and party who tries to do everything possible to really to destroy this reputation of e voting because obviously they are not getting their votes from e voters because it still shows somehow. I, I wouldn't say that there is any age cap or any kind of other caps when we look at e voters. Actually, you cannot say that it somehow gives advantages to any kind of social groups. No, it's, it's <laughs> statistically, it's, 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 it gives everybody. Yeah. But I wouldn't pay too much attention either to, I mean, it's by the end, it's exactly showcases what we have been talking here. It's just a tool, just an additional opportunity. And those people who want to be voting, who want, who have very, very strong sense of duty, they would vote anyway. So it, in a way, I would say probably will not bring new voters, but again, I cannot test it because probably our turnout would have been lower. Because at the same time, I know that many young people who are studying abroad, including my own son, who can only thanks to e-voting, he can still give a, a, a participate election. So in a way, this gives new, but I think it should be considered just a tool. Yeah. So it's not really a democratic innovation, just a no. digital solution for the process which is already taking place. And it's a kind of part of the e-government services. And just the last point, that I, as far as I have understood, young people in Estonia who are not traveling but who can do uh, physical voting, say, are to all going to the polling station yes. because for them, I mean, probably more than for us, for older people, this is, I mean, digital is more for fun, for entertainment, and this is like real act, real civic duty I'm fulfilling and say, say go physically. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Tinen, um, as far as I understand the concept and the idea of the strategy, which is going to be created, uh, Digital Slovenia 2030, is also building on the same uh, premises as the Estonian uh, um, digitalization um, policy. Um, are the, is the government maybe considering of implementing e-voting? Because previous governments have this also put this uh, e-voting into the coalition agreements by the political parties. Are there any signals for the current government to also do the same? Or e-voting e is not currently the issue? Uh, yes, um, I will say it like this. It will be in two phases. So we firmly believe in doing pilots. 
gather, gathering as much data as possible, um, going twice, three times back to the drawing board, and coming out with a system that works. We believe that it is very important then that when we present e-voting as a tool, which we agree upon, it has to work. Mm. We have to we have to solve uh, the, the the everyday problems, the most uh, most uh, of, uh, often problems that the, this tool presents itself. But more than that, we have to raise the awareness about it. We have to we have to uh, again we have to raise the digital competences of people because, like you brilliantly put it. It's a matter of culture. It's a mat matter of cultural thing. Why do you go voting? Mm -hmm. Why do you go voting uh, uh, to the pool box? Why don't you vote at home? You, have, you want to have some experience from it. So again, we look at e-voting from the digital inclusion part as one of the tools that will enable bigger participation in elections. But we cannot, we cannot uh, how would I say, we cannot see past the results that we will get from the pilots, if this is something that will really happen, mm -hmm. or if this only means that some groups uh, will, will use this tool to vote and some other people won't be voting anymore. We have to understand that mm -hmm. this change will happen in this decade. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that most of European nations before 2030 will come out with some kind of uh, e-voting tool. But how these tools in various European nation states will be implemented, it will vary uh, from the cultural state or aspects of, of voting per se in mm -hmm. these countries. So to repeat myself, yes, Slovenian government uh, has ambitions and clear plans uh, regarding e-voting and it is something that we wish to implement uh, in the next, uh, next years. Thank you. Thank you. And just before giving the floor to the audience, but please, seriously, Alvin and Dre, electronic voting in one word, yes or no? <laughs> one word, yes or no? <laughs> yes, but. Okay. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Definitely. Definitely, yes. Definitely. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> now, I thank you very much uh, to the panelists for these very interesting introductions and thoughts. Um, now I'm giving the floor to the audience. Um, please, any questions? Petko, please. Um, can we? Okay. Yes, yes, I will give the mic. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Petko Bukiv. I'm uh, from Polinfo. My background is in media management and communications. It was really a great pleasure listening to everybody here. I just would like to ask you to if we turn the camera around, like we were talking about parts of the society that are hard to reach, uh, and you were saying that having the digital tools does not mean that we're going to leave them. How about the other way around? Those parts of society that uh, become too vocal because of the digital mm -hmm. tools, like how do you handle uh, disinformation and distortion of public debate because of the empowerment uh, electronic mm -hmm. tools give to a small, uh, very noisy, and not always led by the best intention for mm -hmm. the society. Thanks. Because there is, this is a specific question for any from the panelists, or which yeah. one you want to take? Everyone take who wants to address it. Okay. <laughs> I think Anyone wants to address it? I think it's for um, <laughs> In three sentences, your answer. Anybody wants to? Uh, Christina. Christina. Yeah. Uh, okay, I would say, I, I think that we should start thing to to abolish uh, uh, anonymization. So if you're in social media, you should be yourself, not something else. So you carry on uh, the responsibilities you have in daily life. You cannot be without the responsibility and not to be accountable for what you are doing without uh, in, in because you are in the digital world. Because we, we were mentioning emotions, you know, you're hurting emotions also in digital world, not uh, only in the real world. You know, so this is uh, something, uh, uh, and the digital is not a replacement of the real. You know, it's, it, it should be a kind of an improvement, uh, make it better. But, uh, not, so I, I think that the only thing is uh, uh, the anonymization of, of, of uh, profiles in, in social media. Uh, 
you know, with your social security number or whatever. So that we know, all know who you are. But may I just say something? I don't want, I don't want the government to reach to all at all times. You know, this is something we should also think about. Uh, I still also wanted to. Address. Yes, I, I just wanted to briefly say that, well, we have indeed realized how important this media literacy topic is and really to educate different target groups and citizens group in, in really in, in, in digital matters and, and not being so digitally vulnerable because we have really discovered we are now into one concrete project when we address um, Georgian and Ukrainian uh, civil society organizations educating them to do their further advocacy on how to deal with digital vulnerability because we have discovered indeed digital has cre created absolutely new citizen groups who were not who are not traditionally vulnerable like youngsters or school kids or elderly who are very easily targeted by non-friendly powers, let's say, and which is especially relevant in this part of the world we, we are living. So media literacy, digital vulnerability is absolutely something we should be dealing with. Thank you. Uh, Andre, I also, I know you wanted to address that. I would just, before um, giving you the floor, maybe any else has a question. Okay, then we will take one more question. Okay, so my question from, I have two, but I will ask just one, uh, then to Tilan. If I understood you correctly, you mentioned in the response to, your, to the first question something along the lines that basically people do not really like to be treated as users of the maps, this top-down approach. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on that? Uh, have you seen some bad cases where those people who were trying to engage people digitally were doing that in some arrogant manner? Or what, what is it that people do not like about this? Okay, thank you for the question. Perhaps I was a, bit, a tad misunderstood. Uh, the point is that the focus should not be only on the on the technological part uh, for e-participation. Um, in many cases, those that use these methods are from uh, are taken as are uh, how would they say are identified, categorized as consumers by those that make these platforms. So the focus is mm -hmm. too much on the user experience with those tools. It more focus should be on the content, not the technological aspect. That's that's the that's the point I wanted to make. Okay, uh, and if I can only give a short yes, reply to the please. to the previous question, uh, I agree. I agree with with other panelists. Uh, we have to talk about uh, we have to talk about privacy and anonymity, and we have to talk about reconceptualization of those two con concepts. Why? Because we live in a cosmopolitan society. There is no more east and west. We are one big, sometimes more happy, sometimes less happy family, but we have to start acting and making decisions as a planetary species. If we want to mitigate the biggest challenges that we face, like climate change, it's not something that Europe faces and Africa doesn't, for instance. I mean, everybody faces some challenges. So we have to reconceptualize Few, uh, few, few concepts that we that we talk about, and when we do that, all the regulatory changes will have to follow. Thank you. <clears throat> Any more questions from the audience? Oh. Hello. Um, so uh, you talked about um, voting, uh, and for me, there's. Uh, kind of last mile of, of participation. So it's, it's the easiest one, it's the one that is more associated. But I, um, my question here is, um, in your opinion, what is the quality of participation previously the, before the vote, like uh, gathering ideas, discussions, debates, um, uh, when we are talking about online tools, uh, techno technology tools, whatever, versus um, group meetings, uh, 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 in-person events. 
do you believe that the quality of the, the outcome is similar or that there is a big difference between it? Or have you not yet thought about it? Anyone specifically? Sorry. Okay. Who would like to take this challenge? <laughs> Uh, this is the last question, so we are going to take on the audience, so please would like to take this challenge. The difference between the offline and the digital Maybe. Well, decision Maybe. making. <laughs> Christina, please <laughs> start. Yeah, well, it's, I think it's, it's a brilliant question because I really studied this thing. Well, already back 2011, I was also working for university at that time, um, teaching communication and uh, students and journal future journalists and we were analyzing Estonian online campaigns 2011 parties just used uh, or started to use Twitter and Facebook and so on and 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 we were analyzing with students how bodies communicated there how was the discussion and I well I haven't repeated in, uh, exactly this level of analysis now but I must say that if I'm looking at the online discussions right now, so many years have passed, so many elections have passed, I don't think that there is a much better quality <laughs> on those. I mean, the, yeah, it's professionally, visually, these spaces are so much better. They look nicer, online campaign is so much nicer and fancier and sexier, but I don't think that, that the discussion itself has gone <laughs> further, so I'm afraid saying so. But. Okay. Um, just, uh, Christina, thank you. Actually, uh, Andre, I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to get back to the first question because you wanted to address this issue of the anonymity and, uh, and, uh, and the privacy, and because I don't want to, anyone from the panel is left behind. So maybe you can address yeah, will, this in, in just in one sentence so that we can close the panel. Sure. I will try to connect both uh, both spaces. Actually, uh, the, the, your question is uh, to the point. Uh, and right on the money, uh, translating deliberative process into digital world, world is one of the toughest nuts to crack, right? And this is the precisely the, 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 the uh, point where most of the e-participatory tools fail to, um, to offer a clear-cut architecture where one could actually in the digital world uh, have a meaningful deliberation that would resemble an in-person deliberation but give it uh, to the but offer it to the masses so we know that in person maybe 100 1000 people can deliberate but we need tools that can offer uh, tens of thousands of people to deliberate at the same time. So this is uh, this is where our intention is to we have to strengthen this part of the digital e-tooling, and uh, to 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 end with the first uh, the first question about the um, hate speech. Basically, I think that we should start uh, dividing uh, social media into two categories. One should be called for fun social media whatever, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, you name it. Um, and if we cannot solve the problem of hate speech there, it's not our problem to solve. Let the owners of those digital platforms deal with that. But what we can do is offer uh, serious, quote unquote, social platforms where we can have meaningful, meaningful discussion and solve the problem of hate speech, probably not entirely because we cannot solve it even in an, anal an analog space. Uh, one will always be hateful, right? But we can definitely uh, reduce it by a large amount by uh, just allowing re registered users to participate. And Web3 technology definitely enables us to, to offer secrecy and at the same time verifiability of the participants. So where one can feel safe that he's not really ex exposing themselves in person with their own name, but if, they are, uh, inten if their intention is to be hateful, we can trace back to and see who that is and basically just... Okay, thank you very much, Andre. <clears throat> I would like to now conclude the uh, panel. Um, and I would like to refer to the uh, words of the Thielen, who said that um, one of the main quests of the humanity is pursuing the happiness. And we 
I can say we agree that the happiness is not going to be delivered by the magic stick or the digital tools, but still can be one of the elements or the processes that can help us achieving the happiness. But what kind of happiness is going to be, it's depends solely on how we humans interact with technology, whether to the better understanding of political and social processes, securing privacy and anonymity, um, developing skills, media skills, understanding how the um, platforms are operating, and also through meaning, meaningful strategic planning and regulations by the government. I think all those elements have to come together in order to harness the positive potential of the digital technology, which should be, at the end of the day, and the goal of the human um, happiness. So this would be my final words, created together with your um, with your participation. Yes, I awesome. really thank you very much thank for you. your... Thank and you. thank you very thank much you. to the uh, audience. And now, thank you very much. Thank you. See you later. Sure. I can, uh, we have another organization here, actually.